I think in the 80s, we must stop anthropologists coming into the country. Um, secondly, we have our own academics, we have our own Papua New Guineans who now can become anthropologists themselves. My personal opinion is that uh, anthropological studies in the past has been uh, part and parcel of the uh, colonial forces. Yeah, sometimes they tell us, you go to the library and you look up this book and you read this. And sometimes we ask the lecturers, can we do it from our own uh, background knowledge? And they say, oh no, you have to read the books in the library. And that's why we get very upset. Oh, why should I read a book that is written by you know, somebody from outside? When I can tell it from my own uh, knowledge, my own society. Traditionally, anthropologists studied non-Western societies in the colonized parts of the globe, where people could not speak English nor read the books written about them. But recently, the people who were the subjects of these studies and their children have begun to step out of the books and speak for themselves. Nova visited four communities in Papua New Guinea to find out what the people themselves had to say, to learn about anthropology from their point of view. Altogether in this country, there are about three million people who speak 750 different languages. The country gained independence in 1975, ending nearly a century of colonial rule by the Germans, the British and the Australians. Located to the north of Australia and just south of the equator, half of the main island belongs to Indonesia and half to Papua New Guinea. There are also three other large islands and hundreds of smaller ones. Anthropology, like other social sciences, is the study of people. What makes it unique is that field workers actually live with the people in order to record their experiences in their own environments. The first places Nova visited were the villages of Pere and Bunai on Manus Island, about 400 miles from the mainland of Papua New Guinea. It was here that Margaret Mead wrote two of her most famous books, Growing Up in New Guinea and New Lives for Old. Dr. Mead, who died in 1978, was one of the most famous anthropologists of all times. Recently, however, her study of another South Pacific island, Samoa, was denounced by one of her peers, anthropologist Derek Freeman. In Papua New Guinea, criticisms are also emerging about her work, not from anthropologists, but from people who grew up in the villages she described, like Naha Rooney, a member of Papua New Guinea's parliament. First of all, I didn't know what anthropology is, because when she came to the village, no one knew anything about anthropology. So until years later, when I was at university studying, and that's where we, for the first time, we read about growing up in New Guinea, the books that she's written after she has spent the time in, in Pere. And after reading all of that, then I then look back to the time when she spent at Pere and Bunai, and some of the things that she wrote in the book, I could understand why they were either half-truth or unrealistic. Margaret Mead first visited Manus in 1928, when she and the field of anthropology itself were young. She returned five times, her last visit being in 1975. Her books made the people of Pere and Bunai known throughout the world. She always stayed in Pere village, a village of fishermen, which she brought alive for the public in her book, Growing Up in New Guinea. Here are some of the descriptions and footage that she and her colleagues filmed on one of their visits. To the Manus native, the world is a great platter curving upwards on all sides. From this flat lagoon village where the piled houses stand like long-legged birds, placid and unstirred by the changing tides. It's a world whose currency is shells and dog's teeth, which makes its investments in marriages instead of corporations, and conducts its overseas trade in outrigger canoes. This is Pere village today. It's still a fishing village, but there have been many changes. Financial transactions now take place with paper money. 
Overseas travel is more likely to occur in an airplane than on an outrigger canoe. Children go to towns and cities and other parts of Papua New Guinea to study and work, but they send money to their relatives and they return often to their home. The villagers' livelihood still comes from fishing, and different clans are still defined by the kinds of fish they catch. They are often called the Manus people, which means the people who live off the sea. The Manus own very little land. They are almost entirely dependent on fishing, and they trade with other people on the island who are gardeners and hunters. There is now a dirt road called the highway, which connects this area with the capital of the province, the town of Lorengau. Francis Tanau is from Pere village. He lives in Lorengau, where he is the speaker of the provincial assembly. He remembers Margaret Mead from his childhood, although he didn't really understand why she was there. Now my father told me that she is studying something about the anthropologies, but I can't tell you about that one because I'm also not know what she's studying about. So you just wait. When you grow up bigger, do you be a man? You will study some of the things about what Margaret Mead did in our village. Mead's older friends, who could not read, were never really sure what an anthropologist was, but they remember her with great fondness as a part of their lives. <laughs> Nialawan Pondrakin translates for us. Time Dr. Mead came to Perry, old Perry, the people, the uh, women and men, some of them were young, and they didn't know what people she came for, what she was supposed to do as an anthropologist. However, when they go fishing, or when they go to beat Sago, she went with them. When a woman or man or anybody in the village is sick, she goes there and help them with medicine. John Killapak, JK as Margaret Mead called him, became her confidant and her closest friend. He visited her in the United States and he has always had a great confidence in the importance of her work at a time of change. writing <laughs> book, now you can only mulga the passing, but mulga the passing, you can lose. You know, can you stop? Now, Margaret Mead, Emmy write him story, now all the days of the passing, you belong period as soul. You know, long all the place. Long period as soul. When an anthropologist is intimately involved with the life of the village, Margaret Mead made a film about Perry, which all were able to see and judge for themselves. We brought the film and a generator to Perry so that people would have a chance to see it again and tell us what they thought. They were, they said, very pleased with the film, but they also had objections. September 20th, 1967, to a mom's father and a Lucian mother, a baby was being born. Stop. I'm just like, just like stop Mr. Bill, because long. Ah, this is Mary. I'm like Karen Piginini. I'm all the same. I'm he good bla. He look good long hair, long old big bla man, big bla Mary. Now only like Piginini, man Mary. He no good bla long old again looking. So we want bla something. He's have a staff long blessed side yet. I just want to uh, make a general comment, not on a, a, a specific part of the film, but just a, a general, general comment. And uh, it relates to, uh, I think, for future filming, uh, the people, or actually the leaders, should be, should be consulted on what you wish to film, because there are some things that are against our ca customary practices, and uh, I think we should be consulted prior to filming. It is, after all, their lives that are being documented. Margaret Mead realized that, in her last book concerning Manus Island, called Letters from the Fields, she wrote, only during World War II did we begin to learn that anyone anywhere in the world might be listening. And from that time on, the anthropologist had to assume a new responsibility to write about every people in the world in ways that they and their descendants would find bearable and intelligible. However, it is in this very book that she made a series of remarks which some found insulting. 
They concern people from Pere's neighboring village, Bunai. Nahuruni is from that village. And she claimed that those of us from the inland of Manus are the most unintelligent people, um, usually unattractive, and we don't think abstract. Uh, about things, whereas the Manus people, the saltwater people, are very technical-minded. They're in, more or less more intelligent than the inland people. Before independence, a group of inland people moved to the coastal village of Bunai as part of a nationalist movement to unite the different groups who lived on Manus so as to be better able to challenge the Australian colonialists. This was the first time that the inland people, who are gardeners and hunters, and the salt water people, who are fishermen, decided to live together in one village. Mead had written about the movement and about the village of Bunai with great interest. However, she also made the statements which the inland people found so insulting. What many of them think is that she simply didn't learn enough about them to understand them. As she had mainly lived with the salt water people of Peri village, she was more used to their ways. Seliao Yowat lives in Bunai. He went to school and he decided to return to live in the village. And he has read Margaret Mead's comments. I don't know if I'm going to go to the village. I don't know if I'm going to go to the village. I don't know if I'm going to go to the village. I don't know if I'm going to go to the village. This may seem like a very small matter, a smattering of insults about very few people, but it's all the outside world know of them, and it's sealed in time. The unfortunate thing about put documentation is that it becomes a permanent record, and we held against it. Sometimes I'm offended. I visiting some foreign countries, and someone will give to me pick up a quotation from one of Margaret's meat, and because I'm from Manus, I'm supposed to be saying yes, that's true, or that's the way we're still living there today. Naha Rooney comes to Bunai when she can to visit her family. Oh, every time when I'm just tired of red race of town, just come off and keep away from telephones and people pestering you, just come and relax, go to swim and stay with the relatives. It's almost ready now. Nahau's getting together with some of her aunts. She asks them what they think about Margaret Mead's books. They remember when Margaret Mead visited the village and they heard about the books she wrote. They think her books have a lot to do with the biases between the two villages. Naha translates. We have our own biases, prejudice against the saltwater people. And that's what the, obviously Margaret Mead wrote, what the Pere people told her. And they said, well, probably if she had come and stay with us, uh, we would have told her what we believed of the Pere people. And she may have written a totally, completely different book altogether in our way, how it would have written it in our favor, how we were intelligent, we make big gardens, uh, we hunt lots of pigs, trees, and it would have um, presented Pere as a very landless people, drifters, uh, lazy, they can't make gardens, uh, and they live entirely off the land people because all they had was fish, and they exchanged the fish for the kind of products, garden products that we have. Margaret Mead is certainly not the only anthropologist to see things through the eyes of her selected informants. It's a very human problem all anthropologists face in an academic discipline which claims a certain objectivity. However, it's not the only problem faced by anthropologists and their subjects. Now that the children of these villages have learned to read English, they've been able to read what Margaret Mead wrote. At a council meeting in Bunai, people told us something of what they thought about being in her books. Well, uh, time I've been come long Pere, na Bunai, I've been writing one black book. This time I've been studying long Mosby, all this black book long and I've been come out long all get a library. I've been receiving some library in the University of Papua New Guinea. 
na all this labuk all some la mangi bin lawe all no bin hamas true long this labuk we involve him all the manus bin stab inside we plant something we false he been based us all pere and mom la something we wrong long this labuk long en na na la something he wrong long en he been charge all this labuk he any more hamas money he give him hamas lo pere na bunai something we go he no long nothing I make it seem when I'm something true, long time I'm inside long place when I'm kind true story. Well, he picking me go out. Now long time like I come up long you, now I'm like country like him long you, and this like I come up in money. Now I'm now not supposed you like him when I'm something picture or, or camera now all the same too. Now you must cut thinking long villages. The annoying thing is it was until later that most of us learn about the book she's written and learned to believe that it was us who gave her that fame and it was our way of life, the way she lived with us and studied us that gave her that uh, fame throughout the world. It so happened that the West had the technology. Uh, the West had the written documents or writing. Uh, so they went out to study the so-called primitive, primitive cultures and to write about them. So in a way, it has not brought about human understanding, but it has made uh, one human being or groups of human being a subject of study by another. So that process has dehumanized uh, rather than humanized uh, relationships. I think that time, you know, anthropologists were looking at Papua New Guinea societies. Uh, they were doing comparative work. Uh, they were comparing them with their own societies, uh, Western societies. So they kind of put them in an evolutionary scale. And uh, I thought that we were still developing, uh, so we were at the bottom of the ladder. Anthropology was born during an era of colonialism and suffered from the prejudices of that time. Anthropology today is coming of age. A new generation of students would like to see changes in the way the world is viewed. Nova went to a small village called Uyaku on the northern shore of Papua New Guinea's main island to meet a young anthropologist and find out how he and the people he is studying are feeling about the experience. John Barker is a graduate student from the University of British Columbia. He has been here a year and a half and is well aware of the kinds of issues that have been raised by the subjects of previous studies. During the 60s, a number of fairly young anthropologists became aware and concerned of the connection between anthropology and colonialism and uh, multinational corporations and other forms of uh, modernization. And uh, a great debate started between a more conservative, old-style anthropology and, and the young ones coming up saying that anthropologists should be now involved and in actually taking action to, to help people or to fight some of these things that weren't so good. I think my experience was probably typical of other anthropologists my age who were sort of born and bred on that stuff. And we've tried to incorporate it into the kind of work we do. And I think it's changed the, uh, the shape of both anthropological research and anthropological writing. The me, or the first one here, what's, what's, what would be the name of this first ship? It's a new age for the people of Uyaku too. Children here now go to a school, which is part of the national education system. They study English, world history, and math. Rectangle. Rectangle. The secret? Yes. Hmm. Yes. 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 Um, Raymond, would you come up here and then pick up? In the past, the children would have spent most of their time learning from the parents how to build canoes, how to make gardens, and how to hunt in the jungle. And from their grandparents, they would have learned the history and folk tales of their people. Yes. Now it is John Barker who is one of the most avid students of these tales. He listens to one of the oldest women in the village tell a popular tale. Gorobuka matare bimba baka sel. Tikaka. 
Thank you. So they made a new canoe, put it next to the canoe, and then both of them sailed out. Put it and start pedaling. What was the word for paddling? How did she say that? Dikakasi. So she repeated that mm. several times. Mm. So they paddling, paddling, paddling? Yeah. Okay. The folk tale that John has just recorded and is now getting some help translating is part of a larger project, which is to take down the clan histories of this village. It's a project which has the support of the villagers who are afraid of losing some of their history. Now that the children go to school, the parents spend less time with them and they don't learn as much about their own past. The recording of these unwritten clan histories has also created one of John's major problems. We're used to having one version of history, but here there are 12 different clans, each with its own history. Taking down the clan histories has not always been easy. Um, you go to one, uh, one group and they'll tell you one story, and you go to another group and they tell you another story. And, um, according to the morality of the place, the ethics of the place, each clan is only supposed to tell its own story. It be, their story belongs to them. They're, they have certain customs and ornaments and so on that belong only to them. They're not supposed to talk about any other group. But the fact of the matter is that they almost can't help talking about other groups because they all migrated into the area together. So as I've taken down the histories, I've continually tripped up against contradictions and uh, holes in the information and so on. And I found that I've had to ask people questions about not so much about other clans' histories, but when another clan asks, says something about their clan, then I pass on the question to them. And in some occasions, people have gotten quite upset um, to find out that there's not full agreement in the village. In the village situation, there's never just one truth. That's a, a myth that's been partly taught by anthropologists and it's in the popular press, and so it's part of a popular belief. The village council is where important matters are discussed and decided. The people of Uyaku held a council meeting while we were there so that we could hear their opinions about having an anthropologist and a film crew in their village. The taking down of the clan histories has been a focus for examining both John and themselves. <laughs> Nenga Nanta 
Apung mesab baka ka ika ka jabu. Apung awa ini John baka ka me awen di kita kini nanin. Nana me apung totorga kin kin dia o nana mat kin kin dari bumi ma. O kaya ngari kin kin di bumi ma tarawon en kin kin de. Kau tu gugup tayf apa penin na. Baka ka ka hari mala ka sekanin ka sekanin wa wa hari mala. Ia tahu bang. Waka awan sih kita kan ini, ama mune yang kau tu tahu di vaksinasi, atau kau tu sari ini, apa nama tayp apa ni naik kari mana sekarang ini kaya mbi iba. Afun John Buro na neno, neno tahu bang, wana afun kan ini wati beben tirada neno tahu bang. Atai ka, awas tu ni ya nang, John Buro na neng, ikayan si beben neng air rawer sing. Ira itu ait kamarau puanani. Orang nak pun kali nuat ibu-ibu nentong ait pangairo. Dari sini ira itu okey karu wang nengai sentikit itu ibu-ibu ana. Nenang marawana. Nenang nana marawana. Nana boleh kita yang perlu tahu mana library. Orang nengai ro kamera tamatari film. Ero tu tahu mana kiki kita ana. Wapun je jab sah ini. Eko makas ni nang timom mon nangka. O timom mongka. Apun pe John Baka ni nang kayang sebab tibengyera ukar toya buari kayang keperepe. O wana pun film tamatarin. Eko nang tina tuan tetauk pe nangka apun pe ayari tere tere reka. Awe tau kira mala tau bang. O development. O apun Ni nana moni yeta esen tiasin pe ibasi ati tau kira mara tau bang ina ana civilization ni nana nama kasa ye ya beka aku ngati fu sekarang makasa utimumung ni nana nenso ni nana kasenka aipa o amumung ni nana tu timumun nana nenso akan ni nana nana amumun nenso nenso ngak aku tete o aipa ni if he studies a life here and he gets all the things written down in the book and he puts it up in the book. I know, I know some of the young men who would, who would come up later on in the years, who would go to high schools, universities, colleges, would read the book, read the books about it. But the people, all the people in the village would gain nothing out of it. It's a fair criticism of anthropology to, to say that they take things away and they take information away and make a career out of it and they don't give anything back. It was especially, it was more fair in the past when they actually did send nothing back. But it, it's still true. It's an, it's an uneven relationship. Um, I think for most of us coming here, the money that we come on is not our own. It's a university grant or a government grant. But all the same, in village terms, it's an awful lot of money. We're awfully rich by village standards. And that's something that, that comes between us. Um, I'm not sure how it's going to be overcome. I, I suppose the most important thing is to get much more national work being done by, by local people, by people trained at the university and so on. People in Uyaku do appreciate two things that John has done since his arrival. The writing down of the clan histories and the establishment of a library which has more than 450 books. The clan histories will be photocopied and placed in the library. But it's very difficult to be both anthropologist and friend, to use people as subjects and hope to be trusted by them as people. In the past, before people here understood what anthropology was about, such questions did not arise. Now they color all their relationships with the anthropologist. John originally came to Uyaku with his wife, Anne, but she had to return to Canada to do her own work. Since then, John's been perhaps a bit more lonely, aware of his place between two worlds. At the end of the day, we found him listening to some Canadian folk music on his tape machine and preparing supper for some of his newfound Uyaku friends. I think we started feeling at home. It would be almost, for me, it was probably almost a year before I really felt comfortable and had enough friends to feel that I could feel comfortable. Language is a problem and, and a real barrier. The work is a problem and a real barrier because 
you're, you're studying the people. And so it's hard to establish intimate relations, you know, always knowing that whatever they tell you, you know, might be going into the notebook and having to decide there's just some things that are just too personal you don't want to, you don't want to put in. It's taken time, but John has made some real friends. Most evenings are spent with some of them, not working, just settling in. You say grace. Amen. Amen. Caught any pigs lately? Yes. When did you some, go? Uh, not me, but somebody fought it today, but oh. unfortunately, Should I? And the other side. Oh. Parents. Oh, yeah. John has begun to feel at home. Mm -hmm. He's begun to speak the language well and to understand more about the perspective of the people of Uyaku. Mm -hmm. But it's taken a year and a half, and he's here for only a few more months. Most anthropologists spend no more than two or three years with the people about whom they write. However, near the town of Mount Hagen, in the highlands of Papua New Guinea, lives an anthropologist who has stayed on for 20 years. This is a far cry from the ivory towers of British academe. Yet for Cambridge graduate Andrew Strathern, it's become home. Director of the Institute of Papua New Guinea Studies in Port Moresby, he spends much of his time here, in the mountains, with the Quelka people whom he met 20 years ago and especially with Onka, a prominent and respected leader who has had a great influence on him. Mm. This is uh, Onka, who is a leader of the Kaulga people, with whom I've lived for a number of years during the time that I've worked in Mount Hagen. He is an outstanding leader, and over the years he's become like a father to me as the field worker in the area. I came up, I came with my wife Marilyn at the time, we both came up as graduate students. We'd never traveled further than Europe, and so we came here to Mbog. And uh, we found a lot of people waiting there, all of whom greeted us with interest, but didn't say very much. After a while they melted away, and through this crowd there emerged Onka, who uh, took me over to his ceremonial ground, which is just beyond here, sat down with his little son, Namba, and immediately started to tell me something about the traditional religion of the place, ghosts, ancestors, and things of that kind, to which I listened with obvious interest with what few words of Pidgin English I understood at the time. And so, in a sense, uh, from very early on, Onka had uh, made a claim and shown his interest in the type of thing that uh, we might want to do. But this was all quite spontaneous on his part. It wasn't until much later that I learned the, that most of the people, when we first came, thought that we weren't human at all, not human, but some kind of spirit beings. And Onka was the only one who was brave enough to take the risk of approaching this sort of spirit. Andrew and Anka, and some of Anka's family and friends, gathered together at the site of their first meeting and reminisced about those days when they weren't at all sure what Andrew really was. Rumbakal, married to Anka, remembers very clearly. <laughs> you 
Each fieldwork experience is very personal, and what you do with it afterwards in your life, I think, is fairly personal. At the end of uh, more than a year's stay, we were due to leave, and we had kept some sort of uh, long trousers and skirts and things uh, in a particular bag, and so we started putting them on inside the house. We were presented with some pork, which we ate, and we changed into these different sorts of clothes. And uh, as we were doing so, I heard Onka saying outside of the house, oh, what they're doing in there is they're changing back into white people because they're going back to the place of the white men and they were only here with us as black people for a certain period of time. Now they're changing back into white people and they're going to go. I heard this. And uh, the thought of it went with me when we did go back. Two years later, Andrew returned to stay. And each time you make a decision, you don't think it's necessarily irrevocable, but then the pattern tends to emerge over a period of years. I think there's a, a reason why the pattern did emerge and a reason why it should emerge. And that is that all the things that people said towards the time when we were first going to go was, what was the point of your coming here and joining our kinship groups if, after all, you were just going to leave us and go back to your own place? You're playing some sort of game, aren't you? It's not real. So if you take your subject seriously, if anthropology is supposed to be a serious subject, you must also take seriously remarks of this kind. You can't separate off your life in that way and say, it's justified because I'm an academic and of course I have to take these results back to my own country and I have to teach uh, university undergraduates because that's the name of the business. Of course it is the name of the business and one is supposed to do that. But the other side is not just a game. It is the reality that you've come to fight and unless you can acknowledge that and accommodate yourself to it, then in a sense it was only a game that you were playing and therefore anthropology as a whole becomes only a game that you're playing and not something serious. Yeah. Andrew has written many books and articles about these years. Finally, Onka wrote his own book. <laughs> As far as Anka is concerned, the making of his book was just one step in turning the tables on his relationship with Andrew, who translates for us what Anka has just been saying about why it was so important to have a film crew come to talk directly to Anka about anthropology. You wanted to see, so now you can see. Here I am. I am the man who was the professor at Mbug, who taught Andrew everything he knows. He was nothing. He came here a boy 
didn't even have a beard. He knew nothing. I taught him everything. He took all that away, and that's how he wrote his book. So he's a professor in England, but I am the professor here at Bug. Onka traveled to the University of Papua New Guinea in Port Moresby, where he dictated his autobiography for Andrew to translate. Then he wrote a song to get Andrew started. It was Anka himself who had felt it was time to tell his own story to the world. He knew that I had written about the things he told me about, and I had learned, and that I'd in fact done two books about this. But he felt there should be a book which expressed his total view of the society, or a good deal of it at any rate, in just the same way as I had been trying to present a general picture. He told me that quite clearly and made it quite clear that this book was to be his book and that my task in it was to translate what he said and put it down and not leave anything out. Onka and Andrew both agree. The real teachers about any society are the so-called informants, not anthropologists, but the people who tell anthropologists about their world. Now, Usually anthropologists take information away and write it up. The information is passed on to everyone else secondhand. This class in Melanesian anthropology at the University of Papua New Guinea is a classic example. Here's a Belgian teaching Melanesians about their own culture. The question of residence, usually we can say that in most patrilineal societies, a woman moves to her husband's place, so we would talk about uh, very local uh, residents. More um, to be said than about the case of um, paying bright price is that nowadays in particular, we see that the items of wealth that circulate in the exchanges. Melanesians are the people of this part of the Pacific Ocean. They are learning about their society from non-Melanesians and they read about their people in books written by non-Melanesians. Not surprisingly, some of the students find this bizarre. You know, I took up Melanesian society as one of the courses, and I found that sitting in and listening to somebody from outside was a little bit awkward. And that's why talking to other friends around the place, we sort of say, oh, come on, I don't want to be reading, you know, when they tell us to get books and do assignments. And one time I actually came back to a lecturer and I said, can I write about my own people, you know, from what I know? And the person said, no, you've got to write from something that is published. And that was a crazy idea, you know, repeating, reading about my own people from a book and giving quotations from what somebody has said. We are part of the society. And it should be interesting, and we should be the ones who should be talking and contributing more ideas than that uh, outsider. Students would be another interesting thing to talk about the own societies instead of you know the lecturers themselves dominating the whole thing and then has answering questions and asking questions, pretending that we are from an outside world are looking into the Melanesian uh, society. I think there's nothing you can do. You know, yes, there should be somebody from here who should, uh, you know, teach the. Uh, the subject. Uh, I think that universities, uh, uh, say in Papua New Guinea and universities elsewhere, must uh, have dialogue. Uh, if an anthropology is going to come, anthropologist is going to come and study in Papua New Guinea, uh, then we should have uh, a Papua New Guinean academic uh, exchange uh, system between that institution and an institution in Papua New Guinea, uh, so that we can also study uh, some elements of social behavior in, the, say, United States of America. 
That's just what's happening here. Wari Iyamo has come to Berkeley, California to study Americans. He's a graduate student in anthropology at the University of California. In 1928, Margaret Mead was one of the first anthropologists to study Papua New Guineans. In 1983, Wari Iyamo and one other graduate student are the first Papua New Guinean anthropologists to study Americans. Hi, Wari. Hi, hello. I was expecting you half an hour ago. <laughs> Worry's thesis advisor is Dr. Laura Nader. Um, now tell me about your Oakland uh, uh, projections, what you think you want to do there. Yeah. The research is about 26 tenants who were living in a transient hotel in one part of Oakland, East Oakland. Uh, they weren't evicted in a proper manner. They were just... Uh, routed out of the, their, their homes, supposedly, by the police. Like any anthropologist, Wari has informants. In this case, one of the former tenants from the hotel in East Oakland. Tell me about the problems you went through uh, when you were evicted. We uh, discovered that the police had surrounded the hotel and that we were locked out. And I had a dearly beloved pet cat in the apartment, and I wanted to get her out anyway, and uh, they wouldn't even let me do that. They had turned loose a pair of half-trained guard dogs, and uh, all the doors had been kicked in. You said you were the only person in your family. You have uh, cousin brothers or aunts, uncles, yeah, I have no, you can... right, I have no sisters or brothers, and I, uh, all of my living uh, cousins and uh, aunts and uncles are quite far separated from me, not, not just in space, but in, t in age. Well, in such a situation, what would the neighbors, you know, think, you know, and would they come out and uh, help straight away? You I know? can't imagine that happening. If you're talking about a neighborhood where there are single homes and people have, for the most part, been living there several years and you're Yes, you could probably get neighborhood help. Uh, but uh, if you're talking about the kind of a neighborhood I'm talking about in a, living in a cheap hotel or in a uh, low-priced apartment, no, because people just don't know each other that well. I see. Worry's thesis involves interviewing not just the former tenants, but the lawyers representing them as well. Only recently have anthropologists begun to study people like lawyers who have power in society. Traditionally, they studied people who didn't have the authority to stop them. Yeah, come on in. One of the lawyers is Michael Lowy, who at one time had been an anthropologist. Worry pursues his attempts to unravel American kinship patterns and finds out that, as in Papua New Guinea, there's more than oh, one okay. answer to any Pretty question. Good. So I understand that uh, the degree of kinship, to what degree it's practiced here, uh, I don't know. But there is some, you know, degree of uh, kinship here, uh, you know. Some degree, worry. Uh, My God. I mean, to a certain degree, there is kinship. No one can deny that there is no kinship system here. Okay, worry. The uh, the idea that kinship is is perhaps not as strong in, in our society, I think is, is an erroneous idea. It's different, i.e., that is, we have a bilateral kinship system. Uh, we have certain descent principles. Uh, people come to me all the time, want to make wills. Who do you think they leave it to? Strangers? They leave it to their children. They leave it to their grandchildren. They leave it to their kin. People come in this office and argue over who should get what, heirlooms, 
Mm-hmm. I promised a certain ring to a certain grandchild. Kinship is very, very important. Some of the things I have seen, having been here for almost three years, is the society seems to be open, but uh, in the real sense, it's closed. It seems like everything is institutionalized in this society. Instead of producing for themselves, they've given the power to something else to produce for them. So what I'm saying is that back home, we have gardens. Here, you don't have gardens. So that means you have given your power to certain institutions to produce for you. Another thing, which is very obvious, everyone seems to look in or wants to look in. And I think it must have to do with the culture itself. And so when you look around your neighborhood, there are some things that are not so visible. So all people are institutionalized somewhere else. The mentally retarded people are put somewhere else. You know, what you're doing is really pioneering, Wari. Because although anthropologists have gone all the, all the way around the world, studying all kinds of societies, very few anthropologists from other societies have come to study us. And the U.S. is probably the most understudied culture in the world. And we did have people like de Tocqueville who came, and we're still quoting de Tocqueville because he made such a Frenchman, who came to the United States to study us and observe our customs and see what made Americans tick. After all, we're, we're a very important force in the world, and some we should be understood and so forth. It isn't that insiders couldn't have made the same points that de Tocqueville uh, made, but they don't. Because you have to have, you have to stand slightly outside to be able to see the things that he saw that were great and that were problematic and so forth about our society. You come from New Guinea, and you look at something that, that, that in a way is incredulous to somebody from your community. There are people in this society that don't have a house to live in, that don't have a home. Yeah. How does that happen? And are there functional equivalents to it? And how does this society deal with the fact that there are homeless people? But then there's still one point being made, whether by Americans or by Papua New Guineans, is that uh, we still are the ones who know more about our own cultures. So an American will claim that, yes, it's true that uh, an outsider can come and see my society objectively and say more things about it, but still I'm in control or in master of it because I know the nuances of the languages or the language. I know the culture and I know the facts. I think what we're coming to is a realization that there are different ways of knowing and different ways of understanding. Mm -hmm. And that outsiders and insiders looking at a society, trying to understand the complexity of human culture. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's nothing so simple as what yes. the physicists study. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're studying the most complex thing you could study, and we can't simplify it. Because if you simplify studying human society, you lose it. So we have this complexity, and we're doing the best we can when you have outsiders and insiders looking at the same mm -hmm. culture and working together. But how much does the outsider need to become like the insider? Wari chose to go to a university and to speak to Western anthropologists in their own terms. Onka's perspective on our world, as well as his own, could be equally important.